Hi, everyone. I'm Lily Sherman, Senior Editor of Plastics Technology Magazine. Welcome to another Plastics Technology webinar presented today by Conoco Minolta. Today's topic, exploring transmission haze. Unlike reflection haze, which is caused by a microscopic surface structure, which slightly changes the direction of a reflected light, causing a bloom adjacent to the specular or gloss angle, transmission haze occurs when light passes through the transparent material and creates an unfocused or blurry appearance of the objects behind it. Inconsistent transmission haze can be problematic in a number of materials and applications. Some industries regulate the haze of a product and can be essential to the product's production. The only universal solution is to gain a true understanding of all the variables involved in the process. Today's agenda is going to include difference between reflection and transmission haze. Causes of inconsistent transmission haze in various materials and applications. Importance of regulating haze in some industries for production. Impact of transmission haze and the appearance of objects behind the transparent material. And strategies for gaining a true understanding of the all the variables involved in the process to address transmission haze issues. Our presenter today is Stephen Dolph, Application Engineer, Color and Appearance for Conica Minolta. Stephen has backgrounds in mechanical engineering and physics and went on to earn a Master of Science in Imaging Science at Rochester Institute of Technology where he studied solid state detectors and color science. In recent years, Stephen was engaged in industrial image engineering. He has a wide variety of experience in spectrophotometers, color measurement, formulation, and recipe prediction, which he uses to help customers develop color quality and formulation programs. Questions. If questions occur to you during the presentation, type them into your question box um, at the bottom of the panel on the right side of your screen. And now I'll turn the webinar over to Stephen. Stephen, welcome. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, today we will focus on transmission haze. So to give an overview, uh, I'll define and give some example applications of haze and explain how its measurement is useful also distinguish haze from a few commonly uh, confused terms. Then we'll talk about how haze is measured and give a demonstration. And I'll end with a discussion of how we can achieve good repeatability and reproducibility and uh, good measurement agreement. So haze is a scattering of light through a transparent or translucent material that results in a reduction in the contrast or clarity of uh, that it, a reduction or a increase in the contrast or yeah reduction in contrast or clarity of um, objects viewed through it. We measure it as a percentage of transmitted light that is scattered outside of a specified angle from the incident beam, and. You can think of haze as a milky effect or a cloudiness that is the result of stray light scattered by particles inside the material. Or it can also be caused by stray light that's scattered by the surface of the texture of the material, the surface texture of the material. As a side note, haze is not the same as haze. And the haze and scale is also referred to as as the APHA or American Public Health Association scale and the platinum cobalt scale. It was developed in the late 19th century by chemist Alan Hazen, and that's where it gets his name. Described in detail in ASTM D1209, the standard method for color and clear liquids, platinum cobalt scale, uh, it was, this describes the scale that was developed to visually assess the 
pollution levels in wastewater, but has since been expanded to other industries evaluating transparent liquids. The scale is based on the color of platinum cobalt solutions of different concentrations, and the number on the scale is based on the concentration of the, plat the platinum in milligrams per liter. Today, spectrophotometers can use the visual assessments, um, can be used instead of visual assessments because the standards can be stored digitally. Another, sorry, another side note is that uh, there's also haze and reflection. And haze and reflection is still a way to measure the cloudiness or reduction in contrast of a specimen, but it's for a reflected image rather than a transmitted image. And the metric is also often used to evaluate automotive finishes or other highly polished reflective surfaces. And you can refer to ASTM 284 for more information. So I'll give a few examples of uh, applications for haze. So haze measurement is a, a useful for a variety of quality control applications. One example would be privacy glass. So you want to have a consistent haze measurement so that from batch to batch, you're getting the same uh, contrast through the glass, but you want a high enough contrast or a low enough contrast that when a person would look through the privacy glass, they can't distinguish any of the objects behind it, but the glass will allow the light to transmit through. So this is uh, great for conference rooms or showers. And, but most of the applications that are going to be using haze as a metric, we'll be looking at haze to evaluate the clarity of a material. So for example, when you have a smartphone, you'll often have a protective film or a screen on top of the, the, the display. And this needs to have a high enough clarity that the image content and text can be clearly seen by the, the uh, consumer. And then also in the medical industry for protective uh, equipment, such as face shields, you want to have a low haze so that medical personnel can go through their daily routines of what they need to do at work without being uh, hindered by not being able to see clearly through the uh, protective equipment. And also, it's a great thing to have low haze when you have containers that are uh, that contain liquids that need to where the levels need to be monitored, such as an IV drip, because a lot of the IV drips will have very low or very clear liquids that are hard to see if you're viewing them through a uh, hazy material. Other applications. Uh, for haze measurement would, in, would are, have to deal with plastic films and packaging. So you want low haze on your plastic films that would be uh, packaging uh, materials for bulk shipment because the plastic film will protect the material but and keep it dry, but you need it clear enough so that you can identify what packaging, what is in the actual package. Same thing goes for packaging of over-the-counter prescription medications, where you need to see the shape, the color, perhaps, but also all of the inscriptions on the tablets. And let's say you get a weird package in the mail, and you, you if it's in a clear enough plastic film, you can return it before opening it and get your money back. So transmission haze is an appearance metric. So normal transmission measurements with the spectrophotometer provide spectral transmittance data and colorimetric data. However, the single measurement cannot provide appearance information that comes from a haze metric. The 
examples here clearly show that there's a difference in their appearance, but the colors are quite similar. So being able to compare to a reference uh, clear sam uh, sample with high clarity or low haze as a metric and using a white and black material, we can get more information about the sample to use in our quality control assessments. Also, it's often expressing haze mathematically can help us better understand how it can be measured. So we'll just go through a little bit of the mathematics here. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, haze is a ratio of the diffuse transmittance to the total transmittance. More diffused light results in lower contrast, so a higher haze, lower contrast, higher haze. The total transmittance is calculated using the white backing as is calculated using the white backing and is a ratio of the incident light to the total transmittant light as shown here. So the total transmittance is T2 over T1. And then the diffuse transmittance is the light that is scattered away from the incident angle. And this is calculated as a ratio of the light scattered by the specimen, which is this entire term here, and to the incident light. And just so you know, the T4 is this, the light that's scattered by both the instrument and the specimen. And it's measured when the specimen is in place and the light trap is also in place. And T3 is the scatter, the light that's just scattered by the instrument. So there's, that's when no specimen is place, in place and the light trap. So we can use this as a way to calculate the, with this term, this is a way we can calculate the ratio of uh, light that's scattered by just the specimen. Now that we kind of, that now that we understand how haze is calculated, um, it's good to understand uh, perceptually what haze metrics might look like and, or haze measurements might look like visually and how, when would we switch from haze to opacity? So the measured haze of several plastic samples are given here in red. In ASTM standard haze is categorized from perfect clarity to extreme haze by percentage. And these standards recommend switching from haze measurements to opacity measurements for specimen with a haze greater than 30%. However, for many applications, useful correlations, visual correlations can be made between visual assessments and the haze measurements that are greater than 30%. So you may want to retain those extreme haze measurements and just supplement your evaluation with opacity measurements if you get samples that are over a certain uh, haze value. So oh, the goal of today is to go over transmission haze, but we need to discuss opacity just a little bit as they're usually related to each other and you'll if if you get to a certain haze level it's often good to move to opacity measurements so uh, there's uh, several definitions of opacity the first three come from ASTM and then I've included a conceptual one from industrial color physics so let's just go over the one from industrial color physics it's simply the hiding power or the covering capacity of a material. But ASTM has three definitions and what's important to note is those definitions determine how you're going to measure opacity. So when you need to measure opacity, you need to stand you need to put in your standard operating procedure which way you're going to measure opacity. So you need to define several things. So in the first definition of opacity, light travels through the thick, the light travels only through the thickness of the sample. So 
because it's the reciprocal of the transmittance factor, we're only looking at light that's transmitted once through the sample. But in the second and third definitions here, so the second and third definitions from ASTM, both of these require that light transmits through the sample, reflects off a backing surface, and then is transmitted back before it is detected. So keep that in mind that the path lengths are quite different. So it's going to be very difficult to correlate two and three to a measurement from one. But also two and three are often difficult to correlate because while they both use a black backing that's the same, that can be the same. The second method that's often used in the paper industry requires that you back your sample with a stack of more samples. So if I'm going to measure one sheet of paper, I'll stack it, I'll, I'll back it with a stack of maybe 20 sheets of the same paper in contact. And that's a good way to see the hiding power of the paper uh, that would be used in, for example, a book. And then the ability of a thin film, the, the third definition, um, instead of using the paper or the same material as your backing, you'll use a standardized white surface with high reflectance. A few applications for opacity. Um, some opacity measurements are used in a variety of applications and some include determining how well a coating such as a decorative paint can hide a substrate. So this is useful if you're trying to cover up graffiti or uh, stripes on a new uh, house if you're trying to paint your uh, living room, paint over that. And then you can also use opacity as a way to determine whether a plastic container is light tight enough so that the light can't react or light can't stimulate reactions of the chemicals that are contained inside. Also, opacity can help prevent the text on the next page from degrading your reading experience in a book. Uh, so if you have very thin or translucent paper, you might see text behind the text you're trying to read, and op measuring opacity can help prevent that. And then it also helps provide security of your personal information, like when we would measure opacity for security envelopes. There are, now let's just talk a little bit about the three most common um, geometries for transmission measurement. There's Diffuse illumination with the specular component included, and that's DI-180, so the D refers to diffuse, I refers to the specular co component being included, and the 180 refers to the detection angle, so it's 180 degrees from the incident light. That's where we're going to measure. That's where our measurement optics will be positioned. And DE-180 is very similar to DI, 180, except that the specular component will be excluded. The third most, the third common way to measure transmission is 0180, and this does not use diffuse illumination. It actually uses a collimated light source at, at incident on the sample, and then, but you still have your detection angle 180 degrees from that incident angle. So you're only measuring the regular transmission. So to give you a little bit of a schematic of what that would look like, here's our DI-180 geometry. The total DI-180 gives us total transmission. So what will happen is the light source will enter an integrating sphere. You'll place your sample on one on the exit port of the integrating sphere and at the entrance port of, or another port of the integrating sphere that's 180 degrees from the specimen, you'll have a white standard. So when, by having the white standard there, the specular or regular component 
of the light source that's normal to the um, specimen will be included in our me measurement. The DE180 is very similar, except instead of having our white standard at this port, we'll have a light trap. So this time, the light that would be normal to the surface and within a certain angle, so the, the specular component or the regular component of the illumination will be excluded from the transmission measurement. And then our 180, 0180 geometry is our regular transmission. And this is done by having your light source, some collimating optics, so that all of the light is collimated before it goes into the spec before it transmits through the specimen. And then you have your detection optics positioned 180 degrees from the incident light source. Now, ASTM D1003 specifies two different procedures for measuring haze. Procedure A uses a traditional haze meter which is a single purpose built instrument. That means it's only built to measure haze and nothing else. And how it works is you'll have collimated light uh, pass through your specimen, but rather than having a de detection optics directly on the other side at 180 degrees from the specimen, you'll have an integrating sphere and at 180 degrees, rather than having a detector, this is where you'll have either a light trap or a white standard. And to measure haze, we need to have both measurements. We need to measure the, we need to measure at the detector with the black, with the black trap in place and the specimen in place with the black trap in place and no specimen with the white trap in place and the specimen in place and the white trap in place with the with no specimen in place. And the detector will be um, measuring either total or diffuse um, transmittance in this location. This is just a simple uh, schematic of what a traditional haze meter might look like. And there are Two different variants that are specified in ASTM D1003, but procedure B uses a spectrophotometer with DI180 or DE180 geometry, which allows the instrument to be used for other applications. So Konica Minolta uh, has, has a large portfolio for color and appearance instruments measurement instruments, and we have portable spectrophotometers that measure, that can measure opacity, but we also have benchtop spectrophotometers that can uh, measure both haze and opacity. Now, our software and our spectrophotometers do follow the procedures for ASTM D1003. However, we don't conform to all the geometry requirements because when you conform to all of those geometry requirements, you limit the capabilities of the instrument in terms of how many different types of measurements it can take. So there are more reflectance measurements, opacity measurements, and a variety of different metrics that we can measure by being slightly different than the ASTM standard, but yet we can get very good correlation with the ASTM standard. So to give you an idea of what some of our instruments look like, here are a few of our bench tops that can measure both haze and opacity. And today we'll be demonstrating with the CM5. And we also have some portable instruments that are capable of measuring opacity. And these instruments are nice because they we offer several different types of geometry other than just uh, diffuse eight geometry. We have some that are diffuse eight, but we also have those 
some that are 45 uh, z zero circumferential geometry or multi-angle instruments. And some of our instruments also have added to them a uh, gloss measurement. But before we can start our measurement of haze and opacity, we first need to define our standard operating procedure. And in that standard operating procedure, it's very important that we specify what our white backing and our black backing materials will be for haze. Because in order to get consistent results, we need to be using the same process every time. So ideal white backing would be a diffuse white surface like polytetrafluoroethylene or a high white highly reflective white ceramic tile. And these samples should be spectrally gray, so they, they shouldn't have any um, color or hue to them. And they should uh, have a reflectance that's at least 89% or higher. And an alternative to the ceramic tiles and the PTFE, which are very stable, would be the white portion of a contrast card, either metal or paper. It's, but one thing that's very important that you know is please do not use the instrument standard calibration tile as your white backing because when you use that repetitively, often the, it, it, if you, re, or you keep taking it off and on the instrument, it can get scratched, you can get fingerprints on it, you can wear down the tile surface, and when you do that, then you are going to get a hit in the performance of, and the accuracy of your instrument. The exception would be the CM5 for haze measurements because the, in, the white plate is internal. So we don't have to worry about uh, whether we accidentally scrape the side of the tile or not. We also need to define our black backing. Ideally, we would use a black trap because this is going to have a reflectance or a reflectance very close to zero. That isn't always possible depending on the circumstances. So alternatives would be a uh, black ceramic tile. These should be glossy because the matte tiles generally don't get a reflectance less than 5%. And we also could use the black portion of a contrast card, such as either a metal one or a paper one. And really important is I recommend you keep a measurement of your backing materials that you've chosen because if for whatever reason later on that you damage your backing material or if you're using some backing material that goes out of production and you can't acquire it anymore, you'll want to be able to replace it with something that has very similar optical properties so that you can correlate your old data to any new data. And now we'll just go through a few demonstration videos. Before we can measure transmission haze, we need to set the appropriate instrument settings and calibrate for transmission. From Spectromagic NX, I have already established a connection with the CM5. We can access instrument settings by selecting instrument settings from the instrument drop-down menu. In the instrument settings field, we need to set the first field to transmittance. And because we are measuring transmission haze, we also need to tick the opacity haze mode checkbox. And then we can click OK to confirm the instrument settings. With our instrument settings configured, we now need to calibrate for transmission. To calibrate, we go to instrument calibration, or we can use the shortcut F2 or simply click on the calibration icon. Once we have initiated calibration, we will follow the on-screen prompts. We are first pr 
prompted to perform zero calibration. We begin by opening the transmission chamber and we will place the zero calibration plate over the exit port of the integrating sphere. When using the optional transmission sample holder, make certain the two arms are down unless you are measuring with a cuvette. Then we can retract the spring arm and place the zero calibration plate over the port. If our samples will completely fit in the transmission chamber when it is closed, we recommend calibration with the transmission chamber closed to block any stray light. Since our samples will overhang the transmittance chamber, we will calibrate with the chamber open such that the calibration will take into account any stray light that may enter the measurement optics. With the zero calibration plate in place, click on the zero calibration button. The instrument will take three measurements and average them. When prompted to perform the 100% calibration, remove the calibration plate. We will calibrate to air since we will measure solid plastic samples. Then click the 100% calibration button. If we were going to measure samples in a cuvette, we would measure to a clear liquid with similar optical properties to our samples. For example, distilled water is a common calibration liquid. This concludes demonstration of instrument setup and calibration for haze measurement. Now that we have calibrated for transmittance and changed the instrument settings to be in haze mode, we are almost ready to measure a sample for haze. But transmission haze requires the backing material to be defined and measured as a reference. In this case, our target white backing material will be the internal white calibration plate of the CM5. For the black target backing material, we will use the zero calibration box for the CM5. This optional accessory is a relatively tall, dark cavity that traps nearly all entering light. The beauty of this particular setup comes from the ability to actuate the white calibration plate from the software. This allows the software to switch between the white and black target backing so we don't have to physically change out the backing material for every haze measurement. Because we calibrated for larger samples, we will keep our measurements consistent by keeping the transmission chamber open. When we first go to measure haze of a target or sample, we will first be prompted to measure the target backing material. With this being the case, make certain no sample is inside the transmission chamber. I will now measure a sample. We can go to Instrument, Measure Sample, or use the keyboard shortcut F4, or we can simply click the Measure Sample icon. Then we can give the sample a name. I'll call this one Haze Sample 1, and then click OK to begin the measurement. Then I will be prompted with the white backing target pop-up window, which asks you, are you sure to measure over white backing target material? This is letting us know we need to measure over the white backing material, in this case, the internal white calibration plate without a sample. When ready, click OK to measure. After measurement, I'm prompted with the black backing target pop-up window, which asks, are you sure to measure over black backing target material? This will be the measurement of the zero cowl box without a sample. When I click OK, you will hear the white calibration plate retract and open the entrance port to the zero calibration box. Now I can measure my first sample for transmission haze. The next prompt will be the white backing pop-up window asking, are you sure to measure over white backing material? Note the absence of the word target. This means you should measure the sample with the white backing material. 
place the sample in the transmittance chamber. Notice that the sample overhangs the transmittance chamber, which is why we calibrated with the transmittance chamber open. With the sample in place, click OK to measure over white. After this, the black backing pop-up window will ask, are you sure to measure over black backing material? Click OK. And now we have our first sample measurement of haze. Now you might be thinking this is quite a bit of button clicking to get a single measurement. I have good news for you though. We only have to measure the target backing material once for the trial as the data will be stored and used for all subsequent haze measurements. This reduces the number of measurements to two for each sample. I will demonstrate this now. First I will place the next sample in the transmittance chamber. Then I will click the sample measurement button. I will call this sample haze sample 2 and then I can click the OK button to begin the measurement. This time I immediately receive the white backing pop-up window asking are you sure to measure over white backing material? While we have the option to re-measure the reference we will click OK to measure the sample over white. Then we will receive the black backing pop-up window. Again, we have the ability to re-measure the reference black, but we'll click OK to measure over black. This concludes the Hayes measurement demonstration. When you encounter a specimen with relatively high haze, you may also want to measure their opacity. For example, ASTM refers to specimen with 30% haze or higher as having high haze. And at that point, opacity measurements are recommended instead of transmission haze. However, for many applications, haze values above 30% may still provide valuable information, and you may choose to keep the haze data but supplement it with opacity measurements when a certain haze threshold is met. Fortunately, Konica Minolta benchtop spectrophotometers, such as the CM5, have the ability to measure both haze and opacity. To measure opacity, we will need to change the CM5's instrument settings and calibrate to measure reflectance. To access instrument settings, we'll need to go to Instrument, Instrument Settings, and once we're in the Instrument Settings menu, then we'll need to select set the first drop down menu or drop down field to reflectance and then we can select our specular component either SCI or SCE depending on your application we'll choose SCI the option for SCI plus SCE will disable the ability to measure opacity we cannot measure SCI and SCE simultaneously if we're going to measure opacity then we make sure that the measurement area matches the target mask on the instrument. And finally, because we want to measure opacity, we'll make sure that we tick the opacity haze mode. Then we can click OK to confirm our settings. Now that we've confirmed our settings, we're ready to calibrate. So for calibration, we will use the internal white calibration plate and the optional zero calibration box. To calibrate, we can go to instrument, calibration, or we can use the keyboard shortcut F2, or simply click on the calibration icon. We will then be prompted to perform the zero calibration. This, will, this can be done with the zero calibration box accessory like we're doing or we can calibrate to air providing that the instrument has one meter of clearance above the measurement port in a hemisphere and 
the instrument is not viewing any light source or highly reflective surface. If you have overhead lighting, this means that in your work area, this means that you should be using the zero calibration box. Click the zero calibration. Then click the white calibration button after the zero calibration is completed. And now we're ready to measure opacity. Now that we are ready to measure opacity, we need to select our backing material and define it in our standard operating procedure. We will not be using the internal white calibration plate as the backing material, as the backing needs to be in contact with the sample and also behind it. We also would not want to use an external white calibration plate as the backing because Repetitive placement and removal usually leads to scratches, fingerprints, wear, or other unintentional damage to the calibration plate. Such damage impacts the accuracy and precision performance of the instrument. I have chosen to use a metal contrast card which has both high reflectance on the white portion and low reflectance on the black portion. These cards are readily available and generally are quite consistent from lot to lot. Unlike Hayes, opacity measurements do not use a separate measurement of the backing material. While the calculation for opacity does not require separate measurements of the backing material as a reference, I recommend you measure it separately. Having a record of the backing material reflectance will allow you to determine if new lots of the backing material match well or can help you choose a replacement if the backing in your standard operating procedure can no longer be acquired. Begin by placing the sample over the measurement port. Then place the white backing on top of the sample. This is behind the sample in reference to the instrument's geometry. We can then measure the sample by selecting Measure Sample from the Instrument drop-down menu using the keyboard shortcut F2 or by simply clicking on the sample measurement icon. Give the sample a name. I will call this Opacity Sample 1. click OK. I will be prompted with the white backing pop-up window asking, are you sure to measure over white backing material? We are, so click OK. Then we will be prompted with the black backing pop-up window asking, are you sure to measure over black backing material? We need to remove the white backing and place the black portion of the contrast card over the sample and in line with the measurement area. Then click OK to complete the opacity measurement. And that's how to measure opacity. Now that we have seen how we measure haze and opacity. Let's look at see look and see how we can achieve repeatable, reproducible results and also how we can compare haze measurements. So for any measurement of color, and I would say this goes to any measurement in general, the key thing to get reproducible and repeatable results is to follow a standard operating procedure. This doesn't mean that you need to conform exactly with ASTM D1003. In fact, you probably won't because it's probably most likely not going to be optimized for your application. But what you do need to define is all the choices you've made in your measurement procedure. So those things might include what your backing materials are, where you're sourcing them from, 
what measurement conditions you're using. How thick do you make the samples or how do you record the thickness of the samples? Um, what illuminant and observer you're using? Those types of things all go into your standard operating procedure and those will allow you to get repeatable and reproducible results. And you may also need to do some statistical analysis on your process in order to determine where you can improve your process to make your results more repeatable. Then we can also compare data. That um, relies on first that your data is reproducible and repeatable, so you're following a standard operating procedure. Then if I want to compare instruments of the same model, as long as we're following the same standard operating procedure, we can make comparisons easily just using the relative haze that comes directly from the instrument. But if we want to compare to a haze meter, for example, one of the uh, traditional haze meters that uses procedure A, then we'll need some adjustment factors. But the nice thing is, is we can derive adjustment factors and we can use them and get very good correlation between a uh, haze meter following procedure A and our spectrophotometers. So now we'll look at how we can do that. So what you can do is you can acquire some standards that some samples that have known haze values from a haze meter. So if you have uh, someone like a partner or lab you're working with, or if you already have a haze meter, you can measure some samples or you can purchase standards, um, haze standards from some companies. And then what you can do is with those known samples, with known haze metrics, measure those with the spectrophotometer, and then you can plot the, um, the known uh, haze values against the measured haze values from the spectrophotometer. So you'll have your measured results on the abscissa, and you'll have your reference results from the haze meter on the ordinate axes. Then we can add a trend line and the nice thing is, is it should be a linear fit and the slope will be our correction factors or our adjustment factors. And as you can see, I've got this plotted for two different haze measured under two different illuminates. And what you'll see is that the slopes are slightly different. So our correction factors are slightly different depending on the illuminate. So Again, this is why it's important to define in your standard operating procedure all of your measurement conditions and all the choices you've made for how you're going to measure haze. And once we, and we can see that these are also good fits based on the R squared value. So now that we have this data, we can look and see what this, by use, what kind of results we'll get by using our adjustment factors. So here, this is switched up. This time I have haze on the ordinate, and then I have our reference haze from our um, reference samples that come from the haze meter on the abscissa. And I've also plotted what the haze reference haze is against itself from the haze meter. So our slope and it should be one, and our intercept should be zero. So if the, if a trend line follows this yellow line closely, then we're in very close agreement with the haze meter. And as you can see, the blue and purple lines are the raw haze data that comes from the spectrophotometers for the A and C illuminates. And then we have the green and red lines, which are our corrected or adjusted haze measurements that simply take the raw haze and multiply it by our adjustment factors. And you can see they're in very nice agreement. 
Another way to look at this is for each sample, we can plot what the, the haze would be. And you'll see the haze meter is in yellow again. And you can see that for alumina A, when we've adjusted, we have very good agreement and we have uh, quite a large difference when we just use the raw haze data. So by adjusting, we can go down from a percent difference of 17.6% down to 1.18. We can reduce our standard deviation and our, rain, our maximum percent difference goes from 20% down to about 2.89, about 2.9%. And the same type of trend occurs when we are working with Illuminate C. We can drop the percent difference from 15.6% down to 1.29. We reduce our standard deviation and we reduce our maximum difference. So we've exemplified a few haze applications and demonstrated how we can measure haze and opacity. And we've covered a few um, side note topics that are related sort of to haze. And then we've discussed some of the critical factors that are used to define a good uh, standard operating procedure and how we can get comparable data to a haze meter following procedure A. Konica Minolta is a global company, but we have local representatives near you that are uh, more than willing and able to help you get started on your color or appearance and or appearance measurements. And thank you for your attention. Please feel free to ask questions and I'll leave this slide up for a little while so you can see my references. Um, and at this time, we'll start fielding questions. Thank you, Stephen. <clears throat> that was very, very thorough. Um, I have a couple of questions uh, from people here. Uh, can you um, name us a, a few specific products that one would use haze at, for uh, QC check? Sure. Um, vinyl tubing, uh, like that would be used in uh, medical applications is a good one um, because in the medical industry uh, you're you want to make sure that any IV drips or liquids that you're looking uh, at appear consistent every time um, it's also used in uh, quality control for films that might be used for packaging and um, it's widely used across the plastic industry um, ASTM D1003 is actually developed for plastic, so you can think plastics such as acrylic and polycarbonate that are, you're trying to match the clarity of glass, um, and it could also be used in, as a metric in glass, too. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Um, Stephen, what is the difference between haze and hazen? Yep. Um, as we mentioned, uh, haze is a measure of clarity for transparent materials. While hazen is a visual scale for measuring liquids based on the concentration of platinum cobalt in it, um, it's the name hazen is just from the last name of the civil engineer who developed the metric. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Very cool. Um, what is the maximum percentage range of haze that, if you exceed, would call for opacity measurements? So, in the ASTM standards recommend switching from uh, haze to opacity when the haze measurements exceed 30%. Ah, excellent. Um, would you recommend haze measurement for measuring packaging for light sensitive materials? Right, so haze is primarily used for um, tracking the clarity of a material. And when we're looking for light fastness, 
if we're trying to create packaging for something that's light fast, we would actually want something that we can, a metric used to check for um, complete hiding, and that's where we can use opacity as a metric instead. Right, right. Excellent. Oh, um, I think we'll have a halt uh, here. We thank you for your questions and any that we did not get to. Stephen will get back to you after the webinar. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you to our audience for attending today's Fastest Technology webinar.